Welcome to Tokyo Wave, recorded in a live studio in Harajuku, Japan, with your hosts, Aaron and Parker. All right, everyone, welcome to episode 83 of Tokyo Wave. We are your hosts, Aaron Randall and Parker Allen. On Tokyo Wave, we bring you weekly updates from our studio in Harajuku. Join us in segments featuring this week's top news, political happenings, business, and other random garbage. To get us started, here are this week's top news highlights. Japan Lower House OK's record $320 billion extra budget for stimulus. Japan Prime Minister Kishida to find way to use leftover masks amid rising storage costs. Japan to simplify entry process for wealthy travelers. This week in Japan. All right, our first news item Japan Lower House OK's record $320 billion extra budget for stimulus. Kyoto News has reported that Japan's House of Representatives approved a record 36 trillion yen budget, which is 320 billion US dollars, for fiscal 2021 to partially fund an economic package to ease the fallout from the prolonged coronavirus pandemic. The extra budget approved by Prime Minister Fumio Kishida's cabinet late last month and submitted to the lower house on December 6th is expected to clear the house of councillors on Monday, according to government sources. The budget will finance part of the government's new stimulus measures rolled out in mid-November to support the virus-stricken economy while preparing for another wave of COVID-19 infections that could occur during the winter amid fears over the spread of the Omicron variant of the coronavirus. Which is also spreading pretty fast in the Northeast United States right now. And the UK. It's going crazy in the UK right now. Yeah, yeah. So of this total, 31.6 trillion yen will be allocated for the policy package, of which fiscal spending will total a record 55.7 trillion yen, with private funds included, the size of the stimulus is about 78.9 trillion yen. Under the supplementary budget, 18.6 trillion yen will be used for steps to curb the virus's spread and improve medical care systems, such as 2 trillion yen for hospitals to secure more beds for COVID-19 patients. For the government's COVID-19 vaccine rollout, 1.3 trillion yen will be set aside. And all of it is going to Pfizer. (laughs) About 1.2 trillion yen is earmarked for the government's distribution of 100,000 yen in cash and coupons for children aged 18 or younger in households where the primary earner's annual income is less than 9.6 million yen. Kishida's government had originally planned that local governments would first send 50,000 yen, that's about $500, give or take, in cash and the remainder in vouchers, but later decided to allow them to deliver 100,000 yen entirely in cash, similar to the handout we saw last year, right? Exactly. So Kishida's government actually changed this policy amid criticism that issuing vouchers would incur massive additional costs and add to the burden on municipalities currently preparing to provide residents with booster shots for COVID-19. So it looks like they dodged that bureaucratic bullet we talked about last week, right? I don't think we're totally out of the woods on that one, but I hope that it's just going to be cash. (laughs) The extra budget entails a new government bond issuance worth 22.1 trillion yen, ballooning Japan's already huge debt pile that has been more than twice the size of its economy and the worst among industrialized countries in recent years. I think a lot of people don't know this, but yeah, Japan has the highest national debt in the world. Um, It's pretty big. Yeah, yeah. Bigly. Similar to like the debt and stuff in the US, you know, I feel like debt is a lot like uh, early crypto where it's like just like imaginary. It's in the metaverse. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> We've moved the debt over to the metaverse. Ooh, that would be great, man. <laughs> we gave it all to Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> In addition to the extra budget, the stimulus will be funded by the initial budget for fiscal 2022 set to be compiled later this month, as well as reserve funds for fiscal 2021 to combat the pandemic, which the government can use without 
parliament approval. So I wonder if they could uh, shovel a couple of those billion yens over to the Tokyo Wave. We like to do fun stuff fund. <laughs> Hopefully. Did they say um, how much is going to small businesses? Not in this article, but there are planned future stimuluses for small businesses. So mm-hmm. I think that is part of this budget. Mm-mm-mm. And up next, Japan's Prime Minister Kishida to find a way to use leftover masks amid rising storage costs. The Mainichi has reported that in response to the problem of a large stockpile of unused cloth masks procured by the Japanese government as a measure against the coronavirus, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida said he will, quote, see if there is any way to utilize them to be cost effective. They make great Christmas ornaments. They're also very good at uh, being thrown away and burned. (laughs) Kishida's statement was given at the House of Representatives Budget Committee session on the morning of December 14th in response to questioning from Seiji Osaka, acting leader of the main opposition, Constitutional Democratic Party of Japan. The storage costs for more than 80 million cloth masks had risen to about 600 million yen, that's $5.28 million, by March this year, and have continued to rise since. The government plans to distribute the masks to local governments and individuals who want them, but Minister of Health, Labor, and Welfare, Shigeyuki Goto, only mentioned in the Budget Committee session that it is difficult to answer how long it will take to complete the distribution. The Japanese government's initiative to distribute two cloth masks to each household in the country to help curb the spread of the coronavirus was promoted by the administration of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. The masks were thus sarcastically dubbed Abe no Mask as a play on the Abe administration's Abenomics economic policies. Kishida explained to Osaka, who asked about the possibility of discarding the masks, First of all, I would like to find a way to make effective use of them. Regarding the validity of the mask distribution carried out by the Abe administration, Kishida said, I would like to think once more about where and how to specifically verify it. Sounds like they don't have a plan yet. Yep. Doesn't really sound (laughs) like there's a plan. Well, maybe uh, storing them at the local governments is cheaper. We could, uh, you know, in America, they all use uh, chimneys uh, for Christmas. Maybe they could burn it. In the chimneys. Yeah, it's firewood. That's what, instead of coal in Japan, uh, you get abe no masks if you're a bad kid. <laughs> oh my god. They're gonna have to hurry up to distribute those masks to all the bad kids. Jeez, jeez. Alright, and up next, Japan to simplify entry process for wealthy travelers. Kyoto News has also reported that the government plans to simplify the immigration procedures for foreign travelers arriving in Japan by luxury transport such as private jets and super yachts, usually used by the wealthy. And their kind of wealthy friends. (laughs) Wow. The move comes as the government hopes such affluent travelers will bring considerable spending power and help accelerate a post-pandemic economic recovery. Currently, those arriving by private jet for tourism need to apply 10 days before landing in a Japanese airport. The government is considering shortening the period to three days, the same as entering for business purposes. So Japan has 10 airports, including Haneda and Narita, which have facilities to process the entry of such travelers. And their entourages. The government will also consider enabling operators of private jets to apply for flight, refueling, and use of a hangar all in one stop. Super yachts and other private modes of travel by water are currently required to declare the number of crew and cargo every time they make a port call. Following the planned change, they will only need to do so upon entry and departure from Japan. While some rural areas lack luxury hotels, high-end restaurants, and high-quality cultural experiences, the Japan Tourism Agency plans to select 10 model locations and support them in attracting hotels and developing products and services for the wealthy. I wonder what that would entail. Mr. Local uh, Prefectural Tourism Board, uh, we really think uh, this area has high potential, but you just you don't have enough call girls. 
Can you do something about that? Oh my god. Could we build some casinos here too? Uh, so we need like just call girls and casinos and strip clubs cuz you know it's the it's for the economy. Beauregard Tanaka, chief concierge for the Japan Immigration Agency's super rich traveler entry procedures desk, said, quote, We think this sends a clear message to those trying to get into Japan. Come on over. Of course, only if you have a private jet, boss. In other news, Jeff Bezos and his private militia have just arrived via aircraft carrier for a six-day tour of Tobita Shinchi, Osaka's famous brothel district. Wonder what he's going to do there. Maybe he's going to launch some of those rockets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I mean, uh, I saw this. I saw this uh, news. Honey, it's called Blue Origin. <laughs> <laughs> He'll have his uh, space cowboy um, hat on. And, uh, <laughs> and nothing else. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. You could totally. Yeah. Let's not even get into that. Um. Saw this news blip on social media, and of course, I mean, way to make everyone mad at you. When uh, I saw some people kind of arguing in the comments whether they plan to implement this while it's very difficult to get into Japan right now, and I'm kind of hoping that they will, because that would make it more funny. Mm -mm -mm. You know, you know, um, I'm not sure about international private jet travel. But uh, this is a while ago. Uh, one of my friends who travels everywhere, he told me that a, a lot of people who own private jets and, you know, they're using a crap ton of fuel to travel all over the place. They actually have a lot of empty seats on these jets. And sometimes the tickets aren't that expensive. And when I say not that expensive, I mean like business level travel ticket prices, right? So like if a normal flight from Los Angeles to Narita was like a thousand, thousand five hundred. This would be like three thousand. So like the business tier, right? I wonder if there's an opportunity for people who own private jets to open up space and, you know, like a charter. Yeah. To charter people over here that, you know, with not such an outrageous price, right? Coming soon, the Tokyo Wave Charter Service, your only way into Japan. If you've got the cash, champ. I mean, is uh, is um, as terrible as uh, the situation is for so many families that are disconnected. I mean, if anybody can figure out how to get something like that working, that's, you know, obviously not taking advantage of people and is at a, like a fair price point. That'd be a pretty damn good thing to start right now. Come on, you know that trip to Japan is what you've always wanted. You just have to pawn a couple of those Rolexes, and before you know it, you'll be sipping matcha on the River Kamo. Oh, you don't have any Rolexes? Well, t- no worries. We have a new bank we just set up. Uh, you can sign up online and take out up to $300,000 worth of debt. Backed by the Elon Musk Dogecoin Financial Institution. <laughs> And up next on Yenna Yenna Bill Y'all, we're going to talk about how venture capital cash is flowing to Japan following China crackdown. You're now listening to Tokyo Wave. Bloomberg's Geroid Reedy recently reported on how Japan's startups are attracting increasing interest from overseas investors as the country starts to shake off a reputation as a unicorn-free venture backwater. Man, who are you calling a backwater? More than 3 billion US dollars or 342 billion Japanese yen was raised in the first six months of 2021 alone, which is triple the amount in the same period five years earlier, according to Japanese data tracker Initial. That's being driven by growing interest from foreign investors with deep pockets, including Sequoia Soros Capital and Peter Thiel's Founders Fund, as well as Masayoshi Son, whose vision fund this year took stakes in Japanese startups for the first time. Which is ironic because... Son and his fund are kind of sort of Japanese, but mm-hmm, mm-hmm. whatever. He's doing it now. <laughs> awesome. 
One factor leading venture firms to seek opportunities in Japan and elsewhere is the crackdown in China's tech sector. Investors, including Son, have said the pandemic has in some ways been a boon, with Zoom meetings replacing face to face bonding sessions and making a startup's physical location less relevant. The interest is leading some to talk of an inflection point in Japan's burgeoning startup scene. James Riney, founding partner and chief executive officer of Coral Capital, a Tokyo based seed stage venture capital firm, Said of large overseas investors, quote, historically they would ignore Japan and wouldn't even give me the time of day. Now, Riney says, quote, there's a lot more interest in Japan as a startup market. PayPal's $2.6 billion acquisition of Tokyo based buy now pay later startup Payday in September underscores the opportunities available for Japanese startups and their investors. Taiborn Capital Management is said to have. Quadrupled its investment in Payday in just two years, with an early investor making a 65 times return. Wow. Guess they're having a champagne party right about now.、Mm-mm-mm. Even SoftBank's founder, Son, who has long been skeptical of Japanese companies, has begun to change his mind. Even as recently as 2019, Son was assailing Japan's businessmen as unambitious. Herbivores. But with his bets in China souring, Son has joined the throng of investors seeking to diversify their bonds or investments more globally. You know, this brings back memories, Parker, of、uh, a lot of my friends who work as recruiters and people who work in East Asia. Whenever the pandemic broke out, really, like,、um, you know, not just because of travel restrictions, but A lot of companies、uh, with the situation in Hong Kong as well,、uh, China just became very cut off from the rest of East Asia. So, yeah, there, there definitely has been this kind of、um, progression towards、uh, almost like no communication with China or very like limited, only remote communication. So, in the past two months alone, SoftBank's Vision Fund made its first two investments in Japanese firms, buying into biotech firm Oculus Pharma. And sneaker marketplace operator Soda. It's an interesting name for a sneaker marketplace.、Mm. Let's call it Soda, like Soda Pop. Soan said at a November earnings briefing quote, It's very unfortunate that there have been so few Japanese companies among the 3,000 we've looked at. I want to increase our investments in Japan. Despite being on track for a record year of funding, the amount raised in Japan remains just a fraction of the $288 billion tally globally in the first half of 2021, according to Crunchbase. Closing the gap with the United States is one of the goals of Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, who has thrown his weight behind the startup scene. A Kishida appointed group of business leaders and academics has called for measures to support new companies. The panel said in a November report while in the US, startups get investments based on expectations of future growth, in Japan, the demand for short term profit makes it difficult for startups to invest in growing their business. Startups are also becoming more attractive workplaces for a younger generation less obsessed with Japan's traditional rigid career path. Paul McCartney. <laughs> Paul McCartney, a general partner at venture capital fund Incubate Fund, said that instead of attending a prestigious university to secure a safe job at a trading house or bank, ambitious Japanese youth are more willing to take risks at new firms to work on projects that they are passionate about. While Japan could claim only one startup valued at $1 billion in 2016, according to CB Insights, it's now home to six, including the likes of Carlyle Group, backed synthetic biomaterials firm Spiber, and artificial intelligence developer Preferred Networks, the country's most valuable startup. Other observers note that the country actually has far more startups valued in excess of $1 billion than many realize. These, quote, hidden unicorns that Riney and McCartney describe often attain that value shortly after going public. Soichiro Suemi Minami, founder of Visional, said, 
Well, if you count all of the companies that have existed for less than 10 years who went public and who are valued over $1 billion, then you'll see a lot more unicorns. Along with the likes of Money Forward and Free KK, Visional is a tech venture that's gone to the public markets in recent years and seen its value exceed $1 billion U.S. dollars. Minami said it's kind of unfair to compare the number of private unicorns in Japan with those overseas, considering how easy it is to list on an exchange in Japan. Companies can go public on the mother's startup board at a market value of just 4.4 million US dollars. A record number of firms are listing in December, mostly at small valuations. Only 4.4 million dollars. Could buy a used private jet for that. Yeah, yeah. Rather do that, just charter people to Japan. Kathy Matsui, former vice chair of Goldman Sachs Japan and now general partner at Empower Partners, said at an event in December, A lot of companies at the later stage need capital, but because there's actually not that many VC or investors willing to provide capital at that later stage, they get very tempted to go public. Oftentimes, they go public prematurely. The mother's index of emerging stocks in Japan is down 16% in 2021 versus an 18% gain for the Nasdaq. Even that exaggerates the performance, with the index dominated by flea market app operator Mercati, perhaps Japan's most successful startup. It accounts for almost 15% of mothers and is up 43% this year. So I guess other than Mercari, everybody's sucking wind. You know, I just started using uh, Medicari recently. Um, it's really good for the used instrument and used like instrument gadget market. I buy stuff there all the time. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really, and it's so damn fast too. Um, I was showing some prices on there to some friends in the States and they were blown away. A lot of music gear and equipment that like never goes on sale is like basically half off here locally, so... Mercari, check it out. Tokyo <laughs> Wave, top tip. No, it's pretty sweet. Trading now at a value of more than $9 billion, Mercari is a rare example of a Japanese startup that has succeeded in the U.S. where it buys ads during the Super Bowl. The firm got around 17% of revenue from the U.S. in its last fiscal year. You know, it really says something about the U.S. where, you know, you know as a company you've really made it where you can buy an ad at that yearly event where big burly guys beat the crap out of each other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> with a football. <laughs> Even so, the biggest Japanese startups still pale in comparison to their peers abroad. China's ByteDance, which runs TikTok, the premier platform for scantily clad ladies dancing persuasively, is valued at 140 billion US dollars by CB Insights. Japanese startups aren't likely to challenge the global reach and valuations of the likes of Stripe or Spotify anytime soon. Parker, do you use TikTok? Nope. You know, I started using it just earlier this year, just out of interest. And the stuff that was recommended to me was really wild. Like there's people that like have close up videos of them writing kanji in Japanese, you know, but it's like ASMR style. Like, so those videos and just like, just weird stuff that I never really would have thought that I would have been interested in. It kind of freaked me out. I, I, I shut down my account. It's that algorithm. They've got a really, really wild algorithm at TikTok. I don't know what's going on. Startup founders in Japan often lack the cultural knowledge needed to compete in the West. While the size of the domestic market means they can become extremely wealthy without needing to tackle other markets. More late-stage funding from the likes of Son and other international investors could help the country take its next step. VC fund head Reini also said regarding Japanese startups, quote, I really do think there's going to be $10 billion outcomes in the startup market in Japan. Reini said he expects a decacorn, which is not as I thought it would be, a lot of corn, but rather a private startup with a $10 billion valuation to emerge in the next three to five years. You got to love all these like Silicon Valley. Decacorn. Decacorn. My other favorite, you know, um, is DAP. 
So DAP is a decentralized app. So like, you don't say I'm an app developer. I'm a DAP developer. <laughs> like, I don't know. My DAP is a deck of corn and it's on the metaverse and I'm making all these NFTs of my bank statement. <laughs> NFTs of your bank statement. Who knows, man? Make a landing page for it, you know? But you got to put it on. You got to put it in the metaverse, though. That's the thing. So I think one thing here that is very true uh, is talking about the competitiveness of Japanese firms. And uh, most, you know, Japanese CEOs and startups know that they don't need to go international, which is kind of the goal of a lot of other, you know, um, countries that are uh, smaller in GDP than Japan, like South Korea, Taiwan. You know, the goal is always to go global, right? Like, how can we get global What's the quickest route to get there? Well, it's it's interesting, too, because at least in the past decade and a half that I've been in Japan, people have always described the Japanese venture capital and venture company market as being very Galapagos, which sort of refers to how Japan's cell phones were like made in Japan for Japan and never really had a market outside of Japan because they were so specialized. And I think this has applied largely in the same vein to Japanese startups, which are often created to solve uniquely Japanese needs. Mm, mm, mm. Or copy a Western idea and make it Japanified. That too. Yeah. (laughs) Which there's a lot of. There's a few of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Aaron, speaking of nifty new startup-y internet things. I hear you've been hanging out in the metaverse. Yeah, yeah. So just some some friends of friends have introduced me to some people who own plots of land in a metaverse called Decentraland. Um, So I might actually be developing a game on some of these plots of land. Uh, It's pretty cool, I got to say. I, before like jumping into Decentraland and playing around on it, I was definitely not so gung-ho about this new whole NFT metaverse boom. But, you know, after really diving in, taking a deep dive, um, going deep into the black hole, uh, I've come out and really kind of see the value in things like Decentraland specifically. We've got NFTs, right? An NFT is a, is a digital asset that's not on Web 2.0. It's on Web 3.0, which is usually a decentralized network like the Ethereum network, right? So up until messing around with Decentraland and seeing this 3D world that you can jump into on your browser that's very smooth and quick, where people buy different plots of land, buy and sell, and on the plots of land, you can make games. And those games... You can receive uh, the um, coin that the you know metaverse uses. In Decentraland's case, it's a uh, mana is the name of the coin. Um, so that's kind of what powers Web 3.0. It's not Web 2.0 where ads are powering it. Like all these, there's you know there's probably like a thousand to ten thousand different metaverses already. A lot of people think a lot of people saw Mark Zuckerberg's presentation and assume that he's basically creating the metaverse. That is not the case. This has been in development for quite a long time. So can you get on the Zuckerberg metaverse now, or is that something that's still in development? I think his is still in development and will be released later. But, you know, the way the way this is looking to be, it really looks like the um, mid-90s with everyone talking about the internet and lots of different iterations of what the internet could be coming out. Um, so, you know, I think a lot, I think this is going to freak out a lot of companies. It's going to freak out a lot of big companies. And I think that's one of the reasons why Facebook and now Microsoft are jumping and be like, whoa, we need to like take some control of this because if we don't, some developers in Indonesia are going to make the next Google, you know, and it's going to be easy for them. You know, I can Uh, just imagine that Microsoft's metaverse is just going to be, you can, uh, find different iterations of Clippy. You know, Parker, it's funny you say that because a lot of this stuff that we see Microsoft as being a tool for it being useful for that won't be useful anymore when everyone's using different metaverses and everyone is spending their time in these metaverses making money by playing games or doing whatever they're doing. So like imagine it. 
You can work on your spreadsheet in the metaverse. See, who who the hell wants to do that? When in the metaverse, I want to I want to ride a fucking dragon and I want to burn towns and pillage towns and then I want to go save other towns and like create factions and do wars and do all that cool stuff and receive some kind of currency in exchange for that. And then when I receive that currency, crystal coin, whatever the hell it's called, I can Go outside, I can go to the kumbini and use the money I just earned by pillaging the village to buy a cup of coffee. In the metaverse. Well, no, no, this would be in real life. This is, you know, transitioning from, from the metaverse into real life. But all of it took place in the metaverse originally. But he, if you invested that money in NFTs, then you could buy an even bigger plot in the metaverse. Yeah, yeah. So the way, okay, a lot of people are talking about uh, binding NFTs to real world assets from a game developer's perspective. I, that's not necessary in my opinion. I think because NFTs, the usefulness of NFTs is so practical in online game worlds where, you know, you have a coin that, uh, let's say let's like crystal coin, whatever, and some random metaverse. And if you earn a certain amount of that coin, you can buy NFTs. You can also take real money, fiat currency, and change it into some crystal currency and then buy that hat for your avatar, whatever, you know. Then the NFT has real value in the metaverse, if that makes sense. All this talk about the internet makes me want to uh, go back to the family homestead in rural Arkansas and start farming cotton again. <laughs> It makes me just want to like uh, start building stuff, you know, in the metaverse. I think I need a John Deere hat. But, you know, it's really interesting to see uh, the curb of investor um, sentiment towards Japan getting better, uh, you know, um, regardless of whether it's, you know, connected to uh, things with China or not. Um there really there there are a lot of Japanese that are doing really cool stuff, and yeah, if we can get more money flowing into this country, especially with startups, and not just late stage, kind of make it more early stage, that would be very exciting. Well, and I think getting back to the startup discussion, the big thing that I see as a huge opportunity for Japan is more successful startups mean more young people are going to hear about these mainly young people being successful, making lots of money and making products that really change the country and can even change the world. And for, you know, Japanese young people, whether they're in high school or college, to be able to know that this is a potential path for them mm. is so huge. Because when I went to university, uh, I actually tried to start an entrepreneur's circle. Oh wow. Or a club for people interested in starting businesses. And it was so hard to find people because, you know, back more than a decade ago now, when I was in school, a lot of people just couldn't wrap their head around the idea of, yes, you can start a company. You can mm. start your own business. You don't have to work for, you know, a Japanese company and spend 10 years sending faxes to be anything. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Um, you know, even now, like when, when he, when I talk to younger Japanese about like owning a KK, uh, basically Japanese version of a C Corp, right. Um, it's just a really kind of foreign out there idea. Oh, that's the kind of stuff that so-and-so does from Zozo town. Right. So yeah, if we can get more young role models, you know, maybe people that are po popular in social media, kind of influencing younger Japanese to be more ambitious, take more risks and uh, not go the route where they're going to be miserable <laughs> working for gigantic, you know, uh, uh, E-Corp style corporations. Welcome to your first day at Evil Corporation. Uh, I want you to sit here, get on the metaverse and mine as many Bitcoins as you can. <laughs> and you'll need to do this for... 14 hours a day, and unfortunately, we do not have an overtime policy. Also, uh, no toilet breaks, so here's a bedpan. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, it's pretty exciting to think about more money coming into venture capital here in Japan, and also with the pending metaverse to take over all of Web 2.0 and move us to 3.0 soon. 
how's Japan going to deal with that? I'm sure we'll continue talking about that on the podcast. Most definitely. And of course, as we're coming to a close this year, 2021, uh, we'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who's listened to us drone on about the metaverse for the past 10 minutes. And we would like to wish everyone a great holiday season. And of course, buy more Dogecoin. Yes, yes. So we'll catch up with you guys uh, in uh, early January. And until then, thanks everyone for listening. Buy more Doja Coin over the holidays and、uh, try to enjoy yourselves. And if you can find it, eggnog is delicious. Hey, listeners, that's right, you, you listener right there. Who do you think should be our next guest on Tokyo Wave? Let us know. Drop us a line at wave at tokyowave.jp. We hope you enjoy Tokyo Wave. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Join us again next week on Tokyo Wave. Except for not, because we're going to go on holiday. See you next year. Bye.